If like me, you binge watched the first season of Stranger Things all in one sitting, then you'll surely know what this is. It's a baby Demogorgon, right? Of course, there's a perfectly logical explanation for the existence of this seriously gross creature, but to find out, you're gonna have to stick around. So grab some popcorn, your best trivia hat, and strap in for this episode of The Ultimate Fact Show. A snail woke up after four years of being glued to a museum card. Some animals have perfected the art of playing dead to protect themselves from greedy predators. But what happens when method acting goes too far? Well, in the case of one very unfortunate snail, you could end up being scooped up and stuck to a museum card for the next four years. That's right, way back in 1846, authorities at the British Museum glued what they thought was a deceased snail to a piece of cardboard for a display. The snail in question, formerly known as the species Helix deserterum, had been collected by Charles Lamb Esquire, who found it in the Egyptian desert in March of 1846 before donating it to the museum. Assuming the snail had simply expired in transit, recipients glued it to the cardboard show card. For four long years, no one knew that the British Museum's catatonic snail had simply retreated into its shell in a deep sleep. Until one day when curators noticed something strange while cleaning the exhibit. The snail's shell seemed to have moved slightly, and a suspicious trail of iridescent slime followed it. They removed the specimen from the card and decided to bathe it, and within minutes, the snail reacted to the moisture and poked its head out to survey its new surroundings. You might imagine that waking up in a British museum after four years of undisturbed sleep would be quite a shock to the system, but the snail didn't seem to care much. After being fed some cabbage, it fell asleep for another two years. What a legend. Why does a small speck of dirt in your eye hurt so much? The world is full of things that can cause us pain. But sometimes it's the smallest things that hurt the most, like getting a tiny speck of dirt in your eye. We've all been there. First, the familiar discomfort of a little intruder on the surface of your eyeball. Then the immediate regret of rubbing that bad boy and experiencing a searing pain followed by redness. Before you know it, there's a bunch of tears running down your cheeks. But how can something so seemingly insignificant cause such a world of hurt? It's all to do with the way your eye works. The transparent outer layer of your eyeball that covers your iris and pupil is called the cornea, and it has a lot of nerve endings. When you get a speck of dust in your eye and then try to tackle the problem by rubbing it, all you're really doing is dragging the dust against the delicate cornea, making the pain even more unbearable. What's worse, you could even end up embedding the foreign object inside the cornea. This could lead to a whole host of vision-related problems because the cornea accounts for about two-thirds of the eye's total optical power. Instead, the best thing to do is try blinking enough to dislodge it. If that fails, you could also try and flush your eyes with cold water. But whatever you do, do not rub it. You've been warned. I don't like to toot my own horn, but I feel like I'm giving out some seriously life-saving advice here. If you want to make sure you stay in the loop with the most amazing content on the net, You should totally take a second to smash those like and subscribe buttons and make sure your notifications are turned on too. Your eyes will thank you the next time some pesky dirt gets in them. Where are all the baby pigeons? What is reality? Do we have free will? And are ghosts real? Might be some of life's greatest questions. But there's one burning quandary that too often gets omitted from the list. Where the heck are all the baby pigeons? It's no secret that there are pigeons aplenty in the world's biggest cities, which means there must be baby pigeons. But ask yourself this, when was the last time you actually saw one? Does this further confirm the theory that pigeons are really just machines designed by the government to spy on us? Or perhaps they just spontaneously reproduce in a cloud of feathers? Sadly, the reality is far less exciting but at least it'll help you sleep at night. Baby pigeons are known as squabs, and the reason why you never see them is because they're well hidden. Pigeons, also known as rock doves, build their nests in places that mimic the caves and cliffs that their ancestors used in the Mediterranean. In places like New York City, they build their nests in protected places like windowsills, rooftops, under bridges, or in other artificial cliff-like spots. Another reason why you're unlikely to see a squab is that they only stay in the nest for about four to six weeks until they're effectively adult-sized. It's probably a good thing we don't see baby pigeons because they're actually pretty revolting. They are sort of semi-transparent, pink, and hairy. Perhaps that's why their parents literally throw up their food to feed them. 
Why do we see monsters in the mirror? Have you ever stared at yourself for so long in the mirror that you start to see some terrifying demon staring back at you? To get to the bottom of these ghoulish apparitions, Dr. Caputo from the University of Urbino conducted a 2010 study which asked participants to stare to a mirror in dim lighting for 10 minutes. At the end of the torture, <coughs> sorry, I mean study, 66% of the participants recorded seeing huge deformations of their face, 28% saw an unknown person, and 48% saw fantastical and monstrous beings. But why do we see imaginary monsters in the mirror? It all comes down to something called selective processing. Basically, your brain can only process so much information at once. While you're watching this video, you probably aren't noticing the feel of the clothes against your skin or the pattern of your breath because your brain stops paying attention to certain stimuli which it doesn't deem as important. The same can be said for your sense of sight. When faced with a bunch of visual stimulation, your brain will simply tune out the non-relevant parts. This phenomenon is called the Troxler effect, which was discovered in 1804 by physician and philosopher Ignaz Troxler. If you stare into your own eyes for too long in the mirror, it's possible that other areas of the face might melt and blend into the mirror, giving you a terrifying appearance. What's worse, your brain likes to fill in things it can't recognize with things it can no matter how scary. That means your mangled, distorted face can easily morph into some monster you once saw in a movie that has been locked away in the catacombs of your memories. Thanks a lot, brain. When you're done watching this video, why not dim the bathroom lights and give this little psychological experiment a go? If you're brave enough, that is. When you do, tell me what you see and let me know in the comments below. Now let's get back to the fact frenzy. Pythagoras hated beans so much it killed him. Pythagoras was not only an ancient Greek philosopher, but an avid bean hater. And I don't just mean they weren't his favorite dinnertime accoutrement. Pythagoras was a strident vegetarian, and he also abstained from eating beans because he believed that humans and beans supposedly spawned from the same source. To prove his theory, he conducted a simple experiment. He buried a handful of beans in the mud, then retrieved them a few weeks later and declared how similar they looked to human fetuses. According to Pythagoras, to eat a bean would be akin to eating human flesh. The solution was simple. He avoided beans for life and even forbade his followers from consuming them or so much as touching them. There's even one account of Pythagoras coming up on an ox who was eating beans in a sunny pasture in the region of Tarentum in the south of Italy. After informing the startled herdsmen that the ox must be stopped, Pythagoras strode across the muddy field and spoke quietly into the ox's ear. According to the herdsmen, who were beside themselves with laughter, Pythagoras had convinced the ox to never desire beans again. Sure enough, the ox persisted with a beanless diet and lived well beyond the years of an ordinary ox. It all sounds pretty harmless, but Pythagoras' bean aversion actually led to his fatal downfall. As the story goes, Pythagoras was being chased by a mob of angry townspeople when he suddenly stopped. A vast bean field stretched in front of him. Unwilling to trample the beans, his pursuers caught up with him and spilled his blood on the plants, ending his life for the sake of a simple bean. There's a bird that vomits oil. There are some pretty freaky defense tactics in the animal kingdom, but none are quite as gross as Fulmar chicks. In case you didn't quite catch it, that adorably fluffy chick is literally throwing up in self-defense, but it gets worse. That isn't just any old chuck up, it's stomach oil. When they feel threatened, these seabird chicks have learned to spew a stream of sticky, smelly, bright orange digestive oil up to six feet away. And if you happen to be a predatory bird, being sprayed by stomach oil isn't just utterly repulsive. It's lethal too. You see, this gloopy oil glues the predator's feathers together so that it can't fly. Things go from bad to worse when the attacking bird goes to the ocean to wash the oil off, finds that it has lost its buoyancy, and drowns instead. This is because the oil interferes with the locking mechanism of the feather barbs and displaces the insulating air which is usually trapped against the skin, leading to hypothermia, flightlessness, and loss of flotation. The smell of the vomit also acts as a warning to the chick's parents who will approach the nest cautiously in case the predator is still lurking. Apparently, even chicks that haven't hatched yet can squirt the liquid out of a hole in their eggshell. Now there's a party trick. Why can't penguins fly? Somewhere along the bumpy path of evolution, it became clear that penguins simply aren't destined for the skies. Like most birds, penguins must travel a long way between their feeding and breeding grounds. But rather than flying, they swim. 
In fact, some of these Arctic birds spend up to 75% of their lives in the water and can swim at speeds of 15 to 25 miles per hour. But this has left biologists scratching their heads over why they did not keep their ability to fly as their swimming and diving abilities evolved. To try and solve the conundrum, a study led by biologists at the University of Manitoba in Winnipeg, Canada, conducted in 2013, examined species of seabirds that still have some ability to fly. These included the pelagic cormorant, which propels itself underwater with webbed feet and the thick-billed mirror which flaps its wings underwater to swim. They tagged the birds with recorders that measured the time of their dives as well as depth and temperature and used the results to calculate how much energy the birds expended for diving and flying. The team compared their results to some that had already been collected for birds, such as geese and penguins, and found that both cormorants and mirrors must spend exceedingly large amounts of energy to fly the highest among all known flying birds, in fact. This demonstrated that these birds are basically sitting on an evolutionary knife point. Because their wings are still built for flight, they can create enough drag underwater, while their bodies are just light enough to help them take off and cool down quicker than penguins' bulkier bodies. To improve their diving abilities, the birds would have to reduce their wings and grow larger, which is exactly what happened to penguins over time. Basically, a bird has to decide what it wants to be good at, diving or flying can't have your cake and eat it too. Where do eels come from? Aristotle thought eels spontaneously emerged from mud and rainwater. The ancient Egyptians thought they were made by the sun warming the Nile. In the spring of 1876, a 19-year-old man spent many countless afternoons retrieving freshly caught eels from the seaside city of Trist and dissecting them in the hopes of unraveling the mystery of their origins. That man was Sigmund Freud, although he followed his evolutionary questions in other directions before he ever got to the bottom of it. Two years before Freud arrived in Trist, the German biologist Max Schlutz declared on his deathbed that he was leaving a world where all the important questions had now been settled, except the eel question. In 1904, Danish searcher Johann Schmidt trawled the oceans for eel larvae and concluded that their breeding ground was the Sargasso Sea. Over the past century, a consensus has formed that American and European eels journey thousands of kilometers across the ocean to spawn in the conductive conditions of this wide sea. As the story goes, after the eels reach maturity, they leave the shores of Europe or North America for the Sargasso Sea and engage in panmixia, where individuals randomly mate with each other. The resulting larva matures into transparent glass eels and make their return journey to spend their lives in river estuaries and respective continents before the cycle continues. It seems like a sound explanation, but the truth is that these slippery sea creatures have not been observed spawning in the Sargasso Sea or anywhere on route, meaning their migration is still a total mystery. The whole thing just screams aliens, if you ask me. Roller coasters were invented to distract Americans from sin. There's nothing like the thrill of riding a roller coaster, but it wasn't kicks that motivated the invention of the very first roller coaster. It was immorality. In the 1800s, successful hosiery businessman Lamarcus Thompson couldn't help but notice that Americans were tempted by hedonistic places like saloons, dancing halls, and brothels. Thompson was not only a very rich man, but an intensely religious one too and he decided to take it upon himself to solve America's emerging obsession with sinfulness. On a pleasure trip to the oddly named town of Mauch Chunk in Pennsylvania, he came across people riding an old mining railway for fun. The railway once transported coal to the nearby docks of the Lehigh River and onto the steel mills of Bethlehem, but it had been converted to a vacation experience when the coal mines began to fade. Tours paid $1 for an 80-minute ride on the disused railway, which included a thrilling 600-plus foot drop that was really more of a slope by modern standards. Thompson drew up plans for a smaller version of the switchback railway, and the first Thompson roller coaster was built in the spring of 1884 in the most immoral place he could think of, New York City's very own Coney Island. His invention would tempt people out of the brothels and taverns and into fresh air, as well as bringing families back together. As we know, the roller coaster was a hit and the rest is history. This creature looks like a baby Demogorgon. Remember this <coughs> adorable little critter? What you're seeing here isn't actually extraterrestrial spawn. It's just a newly hatched chick eating from a feeding tube. With those weird white spots around its mouth, tiny teeth inside its beak, and gross lumpy body, it's hard to imagine this creature ever taking to the skies. But according to some eagle-eyed nature lovers, this is actually the spawn of a Gouldian finch, which grows up to be totally beautiful. 
So what's up with the chick's weird alien mouths? Although we can't be certain why these tropophobia-inducing markings exist, the most likely theory refers to something even creepier, brood parasites. Simply put, a brood parasite is any organism that relies on others to raise their young. Bird parasite species lay eggs that resemble the host and distribute them among a number of different nests. As a result, the two species often end up co-evolving as the parasite tries to perfect its mimicry to blend in as seamlessly as possible. Estraldid finches, which belong to the same family as the Gouldian finch, suffer from brood parasites that bear almost identical mouth markings to the finch chicks. However, Gouldian finches aren't known to suffer from these parasites. This suggests that the finches developed the markings first and the parasites then evolved to mimic them. In this case, it seems that the markings may have served another purpose, like helping the bird's parents locate their chick's mouths for feeding. Either way, you have to applaud the commitment of the parasites for making themselves look repulsive just to get a bit of grub. When you swat a fly, it isn't blood you see. Swatting a fly is one of life's many small victories. Cleaning up the nasty red smear left behind is not quite as fun. But get this, that isn't actually blood. Bugs do have blood, but it's not like ours. You see, human blood has red blood cells in it, which are responsible for taking oxygen and carrying it throughout our bodies. The reason they're red is because they contain hemoglobin, which is a special protein that binds the oxygen. Insect blood, or hemolymph, on the other hand, contains various nutrients, hormones, and other things, but has no hemoglobin. So instead of being red, insect blood is mostly clear. However, it may sometimes have some very light pigments in it thanks to the plants they've eaten, which might give their blood a yellow or greenish hue. So where does the red smear come from? Well, to put it simply, that crimson smear you see when you squash a housefly is actually the result of the red pigments in their eyes. Somehow the idea of wiping up bright red eye juice is even less appealing than blood. A beetle can escape from a frog's butt after being eaten alive. Life as a puny insect is full of dangers and being eaten alive by a larger predator is a pretty gnarly way to go. But one species of water beetle has a unique way of escaping this almost certain death, through the back door. When Senji Sagor from Kobe University in Japan presented the pond frog Pelophylax nigromaculatus with the aquatic beetle Regimbarsha attenuata during a series of experiments in September 2019, the frog quickly swallowed the beetle whole as expected but then things took an unexpected turn. In 93% of about a dozen experiments, the beetles miraculously reappeared after slipping out of the frog's anus alive and well. Segura speculates that the beetles have evolved this defense against the frogs in their marshy habitat. Though muscles typically hold the frog's anal vent tightly shut, those muscles loosen up when the frog poops meaning the beetles could be somehow stimulating the frog's defecation reflex to temporarily open this emergency exit. Once swallowed, the beetle travels the dark, perilous, and airless path through the esophagus, stomach, small intestines, and large intestine. From end to end, this journey took a minimum of six minutes, but in most cases, the beetles emerged between one to six hours after being eaten. The unconventional passage wasn't without its own drawbacks, though. According to Segura, the triumphant beetles were frequently entangled in fecal pellets, but they recovered fairly quickly. Ants can gut an almond. Ants are some of the most resilient workers in the animal kingdom. These tiny bugs can achieve some incredible feats like lifting objects up to 5,000 times their own body weight. In case you needed reminding why you shouldn't underestimate them, check out this colony of ants that gutted an almond to make their own almond flour. Ants are fearsome natural scavengers and have an incredibly diverse diet. Like humans, they are also sophisticated and social animals who've devised a whole host of ingenious ways to locate, harvest, store, and distribute their food throughout the colony. When worker ants come across something to their liking, they return to the nest, leaving a chemical trail of pheromones for other worker ants to pick up. Then they get to work breaking down the object using their sharp pincers before carrying pieces back to the nest. Because ants are so opportunistic, stray food in your home, like this discarded almond, can easily become an invitation. Nuts aren't a usual staple of an ant's diet, but these enterprising insects certainly had no problem gutting the almond to see what they could get out of it anyway. There may be a few reasons why they have piled up the floury insides around the nut shell. Ants crave fats and oils, which they could get by chewing the almond and discarding the unwanted parts. Some ants are also intelligent enough to know not to bring anything back to the nest that will grow mold, while other species like Temnothorax, which often set up home inside acorns, 
might create such piles in the hopes of using the contents for nesting. Either way, this is one seriously incredible feat of teamwork. Which of these incredible facts blew your mind the most? If your brain is hungry for more random trivia, worry not. There are plenty more episodes in this series, and you can go ahead and check them out. Until next time, thanks for watching.